and welcome to a new video from Juggler66, Hour of the Truth. Without any further introduction, I will come right to the point that we will get, I hope, a full hour in the reading of the next part of the secret history of the Jesuits. You know, where we last time took, uh, take, took a break in the middle of the reading. <coughs> <coughs> on page 96, on the bottom of page 96, I will continue because we are starting now about reading about the Dreyfus affair. And uh, before I forget, <laughs> so a little introduction is coming after all. Uh, before I forget, I want to tell you if you want to read also about the Dreyfus affair or learn where I mentioned that a little bit earlier, you can go to my YouTube channel that you see here. And you can open the playlist Behind the Dictators, that is a book written by Leo Herbert Lehman, who wrote this book and published this in 1942 or 1943, I don't remember anymore. It's um, 13 uh, chapters, as you can see. And even in the very first chapter, Jesuits, Jews and Freemasons, uh, is mentioning of the Dreyfus affair. Um, I have even the PDF opened up here. <coughs> It's on page 7 of 108 pages of the book. Uh, and then we can read here that Jules Michelet, the great French historian in his Histoire de France, means History of France, and the German historian, <coughs> excuse me, William Herzog, stressed the fact that those who directed the anti-Semitism at the time of the Dreyfus affair depended upon the instructions and, above all, upon the financial support of the Jesuits. This little sentence in the book uh, Behind the Dictators from Leo Herbert Lehman sums it all up what we are going into very much detail right now in reading The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. Also in France it was necessary to sow the seed of anti-Semitism, so-called anti-Semitism, Jew hatred. Huh? And in France, they used the military and they used this Dreyfus. And we are going to read on that on the bottom of page 96, where I begin now reading in the book The Secret History of the Jesuits. We start reading a, um, a citation, a quote from Adrien Dancet, who we already earlier uh, got to know and I just have to see that I can maybe see later that I have some pictures here so you know Adrien Dancet we were talking about him already last time so just putting the picture here in 1890 the quote starts it is not the king of France's conscience they the Jesuits rule anymore but the general staff just to remind ourselves to what happened before, we know that through the confession box the Jesuits rule the conscience of the King of France. And not only the King of France, also other kings and princes and rulers in the world. But surely the King of France, as we remember, for example, King Louis XIV, um, who by his confessor, Père de la Chaise, and that influence that he had on him revoked the Edict of Nantes. Yeah? So we are going here back into that now they don't only control the conscience of the King of France, but the general staff, or at least its chief at that time. And then the dry food affair breaks out. Yeah? A real civil war which divides France into two. Now, the Catholic historian Adrien Dancet, whose picture is here on the right for you to see, sums up the beginning of the affair as follows. Quote, on the 22nd of December in 1894, the captain of artillery Alfred Dreyfus is proved guilty of treason, condemned to deportation for life imprisonment and cashiering. Three months earlier, our intelligence service had discovered at the German embassy a list of several documents to do with national defense. It established a resemblance between the writing of Captain Dreyfus and the one on that list. Immediately, the general staff cried out, It's him! It's the Jew! They only had this presumption, as the treason had not 
had no psychological explanation, because Dreyfus had a good reputation, he was rich, and he led an orderly life. The unfortunate man is nevertheless imprisoned, condemned by a military tribunal, after an inquiry so swift and partial that the judgment must have been preconceived. This is always what you have when there is a conspiracy and people try to discover that conspiracy and think this and this went so and so, especially when you go to court and you see how it runs there, that judgment must have been preconceived. There were made agreements to uh, blame Dreyfus for the, uh, for the affair. Uh, I don't know, I don't have a picture of Dreyfus himself here, I think. Do I? Yeah, here is a picture of Captain Dreyfus, so let's put his picture in here, because we are dealing with the Dreyfus affair right now. So we can see this picture here. This is the Dreyfus that we are speaking about. The judgment of the court of the military tribunal must have been preconceived. To make it worse, it will be learned later that a secret document was given to the judges without the knowledge of the counsel for the accused. This are these are or this this these are really the workings of the Jesuits. Yeah? A secret document was given to the judges without the knowledge of the counsel for the accused. But there was more leakage at the general staff after Dreyfus's arrest and command, uh, Commandant Picard, chief of the intelligence service after July 1895, learns of a certain project called Petit Bleu, means Little Blue. Those are express letters between the German military attaché and the French commandant of Hungarian origin, Esterhazy. He is a disreputable man who has nothing but hatred and contempt for his country of adoption. <laughs> well, um, this Esterhazy, who I also have a picture of here, and I will show you this one, that lets him here, has nothing but contempt for his country of adoption. Now, what is the difference between this Esterhazy, a Hung of Hungarian origin, who is a French commandant in the military, and what is the difference between him and a Roman Catholic? In that point, that he has nothing but contempt for his country of adoption, nothing. Roman Catholics also hate the land they live in, because they serve another land, they serve another country, they serve another king, they serve the Pope in Rome. Yeah? And when this Esterhazy is mentioned here, has nothing but hatred and contempt for his country of adoption, you can be very sure that he also is a Jesuit-trained puppet. But an officer in the intelligence service, Command Commandant Henry, adds to the Dreyfus file, as we shall see, a false document which would be crushing for the Jewish officer, Dreyfus, if it was genuine. If it was genuine. He also erases and rewrites the name of Esterhazy on the Petit Bleu to give the impression that the document was faked. So Picard is disgraced in November 1896. The disgrace of the chief of the intelligence service is easy to understand. His zeal to dissipate the accumulated darkness was too excessive. The most trustworthy testimony is found in the Carnet de Schwarzkoppen, published after his death in 1930. Schwarzkoppen. I again have another picture prepared here from Schwarzkoppen. Um, we have to look here somewhere. Uh, is this here? Aus dem Nachlass Schwarzkoppen. Yeah, this is a German, um, a German book uh, from the military attaché Schwarzkoppen. The truth 
about Dreyfus. Uh, and this is published by Bernhard uh, Schwertfeger from the military attaché Schwarzkoppen that we just read about here. The most trustworthy testimony is found in the Carnet de Schwarzkoppen, published after his death in 1930. So, the Dreyfus affair was in the middle of the 1890s and this was just published in 1930, so that didn't help him very much, I guess. It was from Esterhazy and not Dreyfus that the author, then first military attaché of the German embassy in Paris, received secret documents of the French national defense. Uh, here we see a picture, by the way, of uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Schwarzkoppen from 1896. That's him, a military attaché from Germany. Already sometime before in July, a quote from Adrien Dancet here continues, Already sometime before in July, Picard thought the time had come to warn by letter the chief of the general staff, who was then at Vichy, about his suspicious concerning Esterhazy. The first meeting was on the 5th of August 1896. General de Boisdevre approved of everything Picard had done so far concerning this affair and gave him the permission to carry on with this investigation. The Minister of War, General Bilot, was equally informed from August about Picard's suspicions. He also sanctioned the measures taken by Picard. Esterhazy, whom I had dismissed, had tried using his connections with the deputy Jules Roche to be posted to the Ministry of War, presumably to try to get in touch with me again, and had written several letters to the ministers of war, as well as to his aide-de-camp. One of his letters was given to Picard, who, for the first time, realized that this writing was the same as the one on the quote-unquote list. He showed a photo of that letter to Dupaty and Bertillon, without telling them, of course, who wrote it. Bertillon said, quote, Oh, that's the writing on the list, unquote. Feeling his conviction of Dreyfus's culpability crumbling away, Picard decided to consult the small file which had been given only to the judges. The, uh, the archivist Gribelin gave it to him. It was evening. Left alone in his office, Picard opened Henry's unsealed envelope on which was Henry's paragraph written with a blue pencil. Great was his amazement when he realized the nullity of those pitiful documents, none of which could be applied to Dreyfus. For the first time he knew that the condemned man on the Ile du Diable, which is the Devil's Island, that that man who was condemned there by a military tribunal was innocent. I'm just gonna change the picture again here to uh, Dreyfus. The following day, Picard wrote a letter to General, uh, General de Boisdevre, in which he exposed all the charges against Esterhazy and his recent discovery. When reading about that quote-unquote secret file, the general jumped up, exclaiming, why was it not burned as agreed? Von Schwarzkoppen wrote further, quote, My position became extremely uncomfortable. This question was before me. Should I tell the whole truth and so repair the horrible mistake and liberate that poor innocent man Dreyfus on Devil's Island? If I had been able to act as I wanted to, I would certainly have done just that. Looking at these things in detail, I came to the conclusion that I shouldn't get involved in that matter, for, as things were, nobody would have believed me. Also, diplomatic considerations were standing in the way of such an action. Considering that the French government was able to take the necessary measures to clear the matter and make up for the injustice, I really made up my mind not to do anything." Unquote. Schwarzkoppen silenced his conscience. We can see, and uh, you see we are having here uh, numerous 
quotes from Schwarzkoppen from Armand Charpentier and Adrien Dorset, we can see coming to life the tactics of the general staff, notes Adrien Dorset. Quote, if Esterhazy is guilty, the officers who provoked the illegal condemnation of Dreyfus and most of all General Marcier, Minister of War at that time, are guilty also. So when this comes out, the quote-unquote shit really hits the fan and goes up into very high echelons. The interests of the army require the sacrifice of Dreyfus. We must not interfere with the sentence of 1894. So, because otherwise too many high hats would probably start rolling, we are trying to disguise all this and leave this poor guy sitting without anything that he had done wrong on Devil's Island. We remain dumbfounded today at the thought that such an argument could be invoked to justify, if we dare express ourselves so, any inquitious, inquitious condemnation. It was to be so all through the affair, which then was just beginning. Of course, we were then in the anti-Semitic fever. The anti-Semitic fever. What does that mean? There needed to be a anti-Jewish, which is normally called anti-Semitism, even though we can discuss about if the Jews are Semites anyway. That's another point for another time. There needed to be a anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic uh, opinion in the hearts of the Europeans at that time, in preparation to what is going to happen during the reign of the Third German Reich, during the reign of Hitler. Anti-Semitism needed to be spread around also here in France. Of course, the quote here goes, we were then in an anti-Semitic fever. They were looking to blame the Jews on everything. Does that sound familiar to anything that you know of in 2017? Hmm? Anti-Semitic fever? That also today, when you go onto the internet and look up about the New World Order, that there are so many people who tell you, it's the Jews, it's the Jews, it's the Jews. They who say that have never read the Bible and understood the prophecy of Daniel in chapter 2 and in chapter 7, because both do not speak of a kingdom reigned by the Jews, but they speak of a last kingdom on this earth ruled by Rome. Yeah? And there is no fifth empire coming, because Daniel only spoke about the empire of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. And there is no fifth empire of the Jews. And the Jews don't rule Rome. The Gentiles rule Rome. But I don't want to go into too much detail on that. But on the, at the end of the 19th century we read here that they were then in an anti-Semitic fever. Anti-Semitism was on the rise. Anti-Semitism is on the rise today again. Who tried to kill the Jews all through the last 2000 years? Who nailed Jesus Christ effectively on the cross? Was it the Jews that nailed him on the cross? Or was it the Romans? Hmm? I think it was the Romans, right? Of course, the author says here, we were then in an anti-Semitic fever. The violent dissertations of Edouard Drummond in the Libre Parole, the uh, liberty, uh, Parole of Liberty, showed up every day the children of Israel as agents of national corruption and dissolution. Well, that's the same as today when always the Jews are blamed for everything that is going wrong in this world. For anybody who knows and understands and studies it, knows that 
It is not the Jews, it is the Jesuits, it is the Roman Catholic Church, it is the Vatican behind that, it is the first beast of Revelation 13. But even then the violent dissertations of Edouard Drummond showed up every day the children of Israel as agents of national corruption and dissolution. So we are speaking about France, uh, what about in the United States of America when there are Jewish people like uh, Soros and uh, of course uh, people who own the banks and uh, they are said they are always Jews. Isn't that giving heat to anti-Semitism in the United States of America today? For what purpose? What are we to do with the Jews? Well the Bible is very clear about that when we read um, Romans 10. Okay? But I'm going to continue here. The unfavorable prejudice so created incited a large section of public opinion to believe a priori, means in advance, in Dreyfus's guilt. <laughs> That's what they do today with the propaganda in the newspapers and all that. That the public opinion is to believe on forehand in Dreyfus's guilt. Now, <laughs> Go to the archives of 2009 of First Amendment Radio when Tom Fress reads from Inquisition Update um, does many, many statements about Tony Alamo Ministries. It's just the same at that time. And Tony Alamo Ministries does stand for a true Bible-believing Christian, yeah, I don't want to call it congregation, but group. And that did not bow down to the rules of the United States of America and that surely did not bow down to the rules of the Antichrist, the Pope in Rome, but exposed the Pope of Rome as being the Antichrist. And a large section of the American public opinion had to believe a priori in Tony Alamo's faults and Tony Alamo's allegations that were made against him of pedophilia and child trafficking, even though nothing of that was ever true. But we can see that again and again and again. Oh, we, we see that also that a large section of public opinion in all the world a priori believes in the guilt of Islam for fomenting 9-11, right? In 2001, it was these 19 uh, camel jockeys that flew different planes into, into the World Trade Center, right? That's the same thing. It's propaganda. But later the author continues, when the innocence of the accused became evident, the monstrous argument of the infallibility of the military tribunal was still upheld, and from now on with a perfect cynicism. What is the Holy Spirit inspiring these judges? Was it the Holy Spirit inspiring these judges in uniform who could not make any mistake? <laughs> Is it the Holy Spirit inspiring the Pope who is infallible? <laughs> it would be tempting to believe in that celestial intervention, so similar to the one which guarantees papal infallibility, the author says, when we read about Father Dulac of the Company of Jesus, who had a lot to do with the affair. So we read here a quote from uh, Pierre Dominique. Quote, he directed the college of the Rue de Poste, this is the uh, post road, where the Jesuits prepared the candidates for the larger schools. He is a very intelligent man with important connections. He converted Drummond, is the confessor of de, de Mune and de Bois d'Effre, that general you remind, you, you remember probably, chief of the army's general staff whom he sees every day." Unquote. The Abbé Brugret also mentions the same facts quoted by Joseph Reinach. Quote, Is it not this father Dulac who converted Drummond and urged him to write quote unquote, the Jewish France, who supplied the means to create the Libre Parole, the Parole of Liberty? Does not General de Bois d'Effre see the famous Jesuit every day? The chief of the general staff doesn't take any decision before consulting first his 
director. So who is then taking the decisions? Huh? Can you answer that? Is that the general himself or is that the uh, Jesuit behind him? I'm just looking for another filter, but let's keep it at Dreyfus for the moment. The Abbé Brugeret also mentions the same facts quoted by Joseph Reinach. Ah, okay, I just was there. There, on Devil's Island, which deserves its name so well in that deadly climate, the victim of this atrocious plot was treated in an extremely cruel manner as the anti-Semitic press had spread the report that he had tried to escape. The minister for colonies, André Le Bon, gave orders accordingly. Quote, On the Sunday morning, the 6th of September, the head warder, Le Bar, informed his prisoner that he would not, from then on, be allowed to walk in the part of the island which had been reserved for him, and that he would be confined to his hut. In the evening, he was told that he would be chained at night. At the foot of his bed, made up of three planks, were riveted two double iron shackles which encircled the convict's feet. When the knights were torrid, this punishment was especially painful. And we continue with another quote. At dawn, the guards unfastened the prisoner who, when he got up, trembled on his feet. He was forbidden to leave his hut, where he had to stay day and night. In the evening he was shackled again, and this went on for forty nights. After a while his ankles were covered with blood, and they had to be bandaged. His guards moved with compassion, secretly wrapped up his eyesight before cleaning them. Unquote. Nevertheless, the convict... We are still talking about Captain Dreyfus and the picture here, Alfred Dreyfus on the right. Nevertheless, Dreyfus still proclaimed his innocence. He wrote to his wife, quote, There must be somewhere in this beautiful and generous land of France an honest man who is courageous enough to search for and discover the truth. Unquote. In fact, the truth was not in doubt anymore. What was lacking was the will to let it burst forth. The Abbé Brugret himself testifies of the fact, quote, The presumptions of innocence of the convict on Devil's Island, Albert Dreyfus, multiply in presumptions of innocence of the convict, uh, multiply in vain, sorry. Monsieur de Bulot's declarations at the Reichstag and those transmitted by Monsieur de Münster, his ambassador, to the French government also state the innocence of Dreyfus in vain, an innocence proclaimed also by Emperor Guillaume and confirmed when Schwarzkoppen, the German military attaché, was recalled to Berlin as soon as Esterhazy, the real cum, uh, culprit, remind you, was accused by Matthieu uh, Mathieu Dreyfus, the brother of Albert the convict. The general staff remains opposed to any re-examination of the trial. Someone is busy covering up for Esterhazy. Secret documents are communicated to him for his defense, and even his writing is not allowed to be compared with that on the quote-unquote list. So somebody has taken Esterhazy, the real culprit, under his protective wings. That smells to me very much like Jesuits, when we understand that Albert Dreyfus was used for starting the anti-Semitic fever in France. just trying to explain to you that book a little bit more than the author does. Shielded in that way, another quote continues in the book, the villain Esterhazy is audacious enough to ask to appear before a council of war. 
There, he is unanimously acquitted on the 17th of January, 1898, after a deliberation of lasting of three minutes. Now, if you do not believe now that Esterhazy was protected by the Jesuits, I cannot help you. All the signs are speaking for it. Shielded in that way, Esterhazy is audacious enough to ask to appear before a council of war and he is anonymously acquitted after a deliberation lasting three complete minutes. We must mention that a few months later, when Colonel Henri was convicted for forgery of forgery, Esterhazy fled to England and, in the end, confessed that he was the author of the famous quote-unquote list attributed to Dreyfus. He omitted it, he, uh, uh, not omitted, he uh, committed himself to the truth here after he fled to England, Esterhazy. Huh? We cannot cite all the many happenings in this drama. The forgeries added two more forgeries in an attempt to conceal an obvious truth. The dismissal of the chief of the general staff. The downfall of ministers. The suicide of Henri, detained at Mont Valérien, who slit his throat and so signed with his own blood the confession of his culpability. In December 1898, this semi-official note was published by the German press. Quote, the declarations of the imperial government have established that no German personality, high or low, had any kind of relations with Albert Dreyfus. Then, from the German point of view, we see no inconvenience as to the unabridged publication of the secret file. At last, the inevitable, inevitable re-examination is decided by the High Court. Dreyfus has to appear again before the Council at, of War at Rennes on the 3rd of June 1899, and it is the start of another torture for him. Quote, he could not suppose that he was to meet hatred more odious than when he left and that his former chiefs, conspiring to set him again on the road to Devil's Island, would have no pity for, his, for this wretch, this poor creature who thought he has endured all the sufferings there is to endure." Unquote. So wrote Abbe Brugret, the council of war at Rennes will only add a new injustice a new injustice after Dreyfus had already spent five years on Devil's Island for nothing that he did, to the iniquity of the 1894 trial. This illegality of the, uh, the, illeg the illegality of this trial, the guilt of Esterhazy, who said it himself when he, who admitted it himself when he was in England, as we read the page before, the criminal maneuvers of Henri will come out clearly during the 29 sessions of that trial at Rennes. But the Council of War will judge Dreyfus on other spying charges, which were never the cause of an accusation or report. All the previous leakages will be attributed to him and documents will be produced which had nothing to do with him. At last, and contrary to all our legal traditions, we will require that Dreyfus himself establish that such a document or paper was not handed over by him as if it was not the task of the prosecution to prove the crime any more." The partiality of Dreyfus' accusers was so obvious that public opinion outside France was aroused. In Germany, the semi-official Cologne Gazette means, uh, means uh, uh, the Gazette of, uh, uh, of Cologne, published on the 16th and on the 29th of August, in the middle of the trial, two articles in which we read the following phrase, quote, 
If after the declarations of the German government and the debates of the highest court of appeal in France, someone still believes Dreyfus is guilty, we can only answer that person that he must be mentally ill or he conscious wants an innocent to be condemned. Uh, he, con he consciously, huh? he consciously, <laughs> he conscious, consciously, yeah, that, uh, that's a little bit wrong English, maybe that's from the translation from the German. Again, this little sentence which we can read in the German Cologne Gazette on the 16th and 29th of August in that year, 1899 of course we are speaking about, if after the declarations of the German government and the debates of the highest court of appeal in France, so, no, take, taking no regard of the declarations of the German government and taking no regards of the debates of the highest court of appeal in France itself, still someone believes that Albert Dreyfus is guilty as charged of treason, we can only answer that person that he must be mentally ill or that he consciously wants an innocent man to be condemned." Unquote. But the hatred, nonsense and fanaticism were not disarmed for all that. Even new forgeries were used, replacing those which had lost all credit. To sum it all up, it was nothing more than sinister buffoonery. The end of it, for Dreyfus, was the condemnation to ten years' detention with mitigating circumstances. Quote, this miserable trial provoked an independent stupor all over the world. France was despised. Who could have imagined such terrible sorrow? exclaimed Clemenceau at the reading of English and German newspapers. Well, Clemenceau, I have a picture of him here. I think Clemenceau, yeah, here he is. George Benjamin Clemenceau, who we are just reading about here, just to give you a new picture in this video from time to time. This miserable trial provoked an independent stupor all over the world. France was despised. Who could have imagined such terrible sorrow? exclaimed Clemenceau at the reading of English and German newspapers. Mercy was indispensable. Dreyfus accepted it to carry on, said he. Quote, seeking the reversal of the awful military mistake of which he was the victim. Unquote. For this reversal, it was no use counting on the justice of the Council of War. This justice had been seen at work, <laughs> and it was injustice. It came once again from the highest court of appeal, which after thorough investigations and long debates, annulled once and for all the verdict of Rennes. A few, dears la a few days later, the Assembly and, st and Senate, by a solemn vote, reinstated Dreyfus in the army. Dreyfus, upon whom was conferred the Legion of Honor, and who was publicly reinstated. This late reversal, obtained so laboriously, was due to honest and courageous men, such as those the innocent on Devil's Island wished to see coming forth. Their number grew more and more as truth came to light. After the swift acquittal of the traitor Esterhazy by a council of war in January 19, uh, 1898, Emile Zola published in the Aurore Clemenceau's publication his famous open letter I Accuse or J'accuse, as it is called in France. Before I will continue with this quote, let me just see for another picture. We have here Clemenceau, the, his publication we are speaking about, but we have mention here of um, Emile Zola, and I thought that I have prepared a picture of Emile Zola, if I'm not mistaken. Here it is. This is Emile Zola. He wrote, quote, uh, uh, it is in, in France it is called J'accuse. Eh? I, I think I have this here in, oh no, it's not here. Uh, it's called J'accuse. He wrote, I accuse 
the first council of war to have violated the law by condemning an accused person on the grounds of some document remaining secret. And I accuse the second council of war to have covered up this illegality by committing also a judicial crime and knowingly acquitting a culprit. Unquote. But the quote unquote knights of our famous company, <laughs> the company of Jesus, were on the watch out to hush up anything which could have enlightened the public. A question from the Catholic deputy de Mun brought Zola before the Assize court of the Seine, and the courageous writer was condemned to one year imprisonment, the maximum penalty as a result of his iniquitous trial. He was condemned for a year for speaking out the truth about the two military tribunals that condemned Dreyfus for a crime he did never commit. Public opinion had been deceived. <laughs> well, public opinion is deceived today as well. Public opinion had been deceived so well by the outcries of the clerico nationalists that the elections of May 1898 were in their favor. Clerico nationalists, this is the cleric as playing as nationalists. The cleric means the church people, the priests and the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. Nevertheless, the public revelation of forgeries, the dismissal of the chief of the general staff, the evident criminal partiality of the judges opened the eyes of those sincerely seeking the truth more and more. But these came almost exclusively from the ranks of the Protestants, from the ranks of the Jews and from the ranks of the laymen. Quote, In France, the Catholics were few and far between, among whom few were prominent, who took sides with Dreyfus. The action of this handful of people made very little noise. The conspiracy of silence surrounded it. Unquote. And another quote says, Most priests and bishops remain convinced of Dreyfus's culpability. Quote, unquote, wrote the Abbe Brugret. George Sorel declares also, quote, while the Dreyfus affair brought division amongst all social groups, the Catholic world was absolutely united against a re-examination, unquote. Pegui himself admits that all the political forces of the Church have always been against Dreyfus, unquote. Must we recall the list of subscriptions opened by the Libre Parole and La Croix, in favor of the window for the forger Henry or Henri, who committed suicide, you know, who slit his throat from left to right. The names of the subscribing priests were often accompanied by comments not very evangelical, as, were, uh, as we are told by Monsieur Adrien Danset, who quotes these. And before we read the quotes, we will just take the picture of Adrien Danset again which we have here already for have had here already for a few times. Yeah. Quote from Adrien Danset A certain Abbe Croix asks for a be, uh, for a bedside that made of Jewish skin which he would be able to stamp on morning and evening. A young priest would like to crush Reinach's nose with his heel. Three priests would love to slap the filthy face of the Jew Reinach. Unquote. Now let me read this again, that you understand what Adrian Danset really says here. And then I want to remind you of something that the Germans were accused in the in, in the uh, during the, sev uh, the Second World War, during the so-called Holocaust, to have done to Jews. It says here. A certain Abbe Cross. Abbe is an Abbe that is someone who is in the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. Abbe Cross asks for a bedside mat made of Jewish skin. So we are speaking here about the end of the 19th century. 
And what did they accuse the Germans of? That they were making lamp shields out of Jewish skin in the Second World War. Where does an outrageous idea like that even come from? Well, you see it here, where the anti-Semitic fever was burning in France, steered by the Jesuits, saying that there was a certain Abbe Cross who asks for a bedside mat made of Jewish skin, so that he would be able to stamp on morning and evening. Sicker? But this is where anti-Semitism really comes from. It is not German, it is not French, it is Jesuitical. And Adrien Danset, who we read here in this quote, confirms this. Only the secular clergy is still somewhat reserved. In the congregations things are more virulent. Quote, On the 15th of July 1898, prize-giving day at the College of, uh, Arque, uh, College of Arque, presided over by Generalissimo Jamon, who is Vice President of the Superior Council of War, Father Didon, Rector of the school, Albert Legrand, gave a violent speech in which he advocated using violence against the men whose crime had been the courageous denunciation of a military error. Quote, Must we, said the eloquent monk, let the wicked go free? Certainly not. The enemy is intellectualism, pretending to despise force and civilians wanting to subordinate the military. When persuasion has failed, when love has been ineffectual, we must brandish the sword, spread terror, chop off heads, make war. We must strike. Unquote. <laughs> this is a real Jesuit speaking, right? Must we let the wicked go free when persuasion has failed? Means when arguments fail. And what arguments can only fail? Only arguments who are not based on the truth, right? Because when you base your arguments on the truth, they cannot fail because, because the truth does never fail. When persuasion has failed, when love has been ineffectual, we must brandish the sword, spread terror, chop off heads, make war, we must strike. This speech seemed to be a challenge thrown before all the sympathizers of the condemned wretch. But how many of them have we heard since? These calls to bloody repressions coming from gent uh, gentle clerics, especially during the German occupation, as for the cry of hatred against intellectualism, we can find the perfecto echo to it in this declaration from a certain general. Quote, when someone speaks of intelligence, I draw my revolver. Unquote. To crush the thought by force is a principle of the Roman Catholic Church, which has never altered. To crush the thought of truth, I want to add here, thought of truth by force is a principle of the Roman Catholic Church. The Abbé Brugeret wonders, however, about the fact that nothing disturbed the clergy's belief in the culpability of Dreyfus. Quote, Such a great and dramatic event, coming like a clap of thunder in a blue sky and bringing to light the department for forgeries operating at the general staff must have opened the eyes even of those not wanting to find the truth. We are referring to the discovery of forgeries made by Henri. Had not, the same, uh, had not the time come for the French clergy and the Catholics to repudiate a mistake which had gone on for too long, they, the priests and the faithful, could have gone en masse and at the eleventh hour, like the workmen mentioned in the Gospels, to increase the ranks of the defenders of justice and truth. But the most evident facts do not always shed their light on minds dominated by certain prejudices, as prejudices are opposed to examination and, by their nature, rebel against evidence. A very important sentence to be understood. Let me read this again. 
but the most evident facts do not always shed their light on minds dominated by certain prejudices. As prejudices, I'm gonna highlight this, as prejudices are opposed to examination and by their nature rebel against evidence. Anyway, what efforts are made to maintain Catholics in error? <laughs> all the efforts of the world, brother, all the efforts of the world. Quote, could they guess that they were scandalously deceived by a press stubbornly keeping covered all the proofs of innocent and the testimonies, uh, all the testimonies favorable to the convict of Devil's Island? Albert Dreyfus, and also determined to impede the cause of justice by any means." Unquote. At the forefront of that press was La Libre Parole, created, as we have seen, with the help of the Jesuit Father Dulac and La Croix of the Assumptionist Father Bailly. The Order of Assumption being a camouflaged branch of the Company of Jesus, we must then attribute to them the start and pursuit of the anti-Dreyfus campaign. A not very suspicious witness. Uh, let me just change the picture here a little bit. And we're going to take here our reading one. A not very suspicious witness, Father Le Canouet, writes boldly, quote, The congregations and especially the Jesuits, are denounced by the affairs historians. And, this time, we must admit that the Jesuits took the first shot with a very thoughtless temerity." Unquote. Another quote continues. The provincial Catholic newspapers, such as the Nouvelliste of Lyon, too informative and wildly read, will nearly all take part in that dark plot against truth and justice. It seems that the watchword was passed around to stop light breaking through and to keep the public in the dark." Unquote. In reality, one would need a peculiar blindness not to discern behind the furor shown by the Croix in Paris and in the provinces the watchword mentioned by the Abbé Brugret and one would also be very naive not to know the origin. Monsieur Adrien Danset says this also in another quote. quote it is the Assumptionist order, as a whole, and with it the Church, which are exposed by the campaign of La Croix. Father Bailly boasts that the Holy Father approved of him. Unquote. In fact, there isn't any doubt concerning that approval. The Jesuits, to whom the Assumptionists lend their name, are they not, since the order was founded, the Pope's political instruments? We have to smile at the story cleverly spread around, which is echoed by apologists, historians, that Leo XIII had apparently advised moderation to the directors of La Croix. It is a classical trick but still somewhat efficacious. Today there are still some folk who believe in a kind of independence of the Holy See's official voice. <laughs> Let us see now what was published in Rome itself by the Servilta Cattolica, the Jesuits' official publication under the title Il Caso Dreyfus. Il Caso means the case of Dreyfus. And the Servilta Cattolica I thought that I had a picture of that here. There it is, the Civilta Catholica. What does the Civilta Catholica, the house organs of the Jesuit order, say to Il Caso Dreyfus, the case of Dreyfus? Quote, the Jews' emancipation has been the result of the so-called principles of 1789 whose yoke weighs heavily on all French people. Now let me stop right here. 
the Jews' emancipation has been the result of the so-called principles of 1789, means the French Revolution, they say in the Savilta Catholica, the house organs of the Jesuits, where we know that during the suppression, the so-called suppression of the Jesuits, between 1773 and 1814, the Illumin Illuminati founded by Jesuit professor Adam Weishaupt in Jesuit University Ingolstadt were the responsible people behind the French Revolution and not the Jews. Yeah, It's again to f stir up anti-Semitism fever in Europe. This very first sentence already. But I'm trying to get through the whole quote here. The Jews' emancipation has been the result of the so-called principles of 1789, whose yoke weighs heavily on all French people. The Jews hold the Republic in their hands, which is more Hebraic than French. <laughs> The Jew has been created by God to be used as a spy wherever some treason is being prepared. It is not only in France, but also in Germany, in Austria and Italy, that the Jew must be excluded from the nation. Then, with the great harmony of former times re-established, nations will find again their lost happiness. Unquote. From the Civilta Catholica. Now, let me ask you, my dear reader, when you replace the word Jew with the word Jesuit, wouldn't we actually learn of the truth? Isn't this another publication that just confirms the anti-Semitism and the Jewish hate of the Society of Jesus, of the so-called Society of Jesus, of the company founded by Ignatius of Loyola in 1540, with the papal bull, Regimini Militantes Ecclesiae, the church at war, and as we know from rulers of evil, that in war the law sleeps? Think about it. And I'm going to read it again, and I'm even going to highlight it, and you can read it for yourselves. On the, on the bottom, on page 104 in the PDF, we read, The Jews' emancipation has been the result of the so-called principles of 1789, whose yoke weighs heavily on all French people. The Jews hold the Republic in their hands, which is more Hebraic than French. The Jew has been created by God to be used as a spy wherever some treason is being prepared. It is not only in France, but also in Germany, Austria and Italy, that the Jew must be excluded from the, excluded from the nation. Then, with the great harmony of former times re-established, nations will find again their lost happiness. Now, we are talking about the end of the 19th century, right? And the end of the 19th century is the same time when what you see here, the, pro uh, the, the protocols of the learned elders of Giant were published very, very profoundly. Yeah? And the protocols of the learned elders of Giant is a forgery because it is attributed to the Jews, but it actually is written by Abbe Baruel, a Jesuit priest, to stir up even more anti-Semitism over there in France and in Europe altogether. The Jesuits are behind the hatred of the Jews. And don't you see that with the Civilta Catholica and all the other publications that they have, because we know of Intermerifica that the Roman Catholic Church controls all media anyway, don't you see that they have it very easy that they can try to stir up people against the Jews or any other group that they would like to put in quote-unquote concentration camps as the Germans did in the, during the Second World War? And as the whole world does with the quote-unquote state of Israel since 1948, because that's nothing else but a big concentration camp, they have the Jews waiting there for their sentence that they will put over them, whatever that will be. But what we just read here, this very sentence, I mean, this is so clear when you know the protocols of the learned elders of Zion and you read those 
and you read this, you see this is absolutely the same talk. And by this alone, you can attribute the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. You can attribute the worldwide anti-Semitism to the quote-unquote society of Jesus, to the Jesuits. Now, in the previous chapters, we gave a short summary of the great harmony and happiness enjoyed by the nations when the sons of Loyola heard the confessions and inspired the kings. As we have just seen, harmony was also reigning when they were the confessors and counselors of the general staff chiefs. Staff's chiefs. Okay, I have to uh, change my picture here. According to the Abbé Brugret, General de bois d'Effre, penitent of the Jesuit father Dulac, tested the same bitterness as many others before him, who were equally deceived by these directors of consciences. The confessions of the forger Henri put him under an obligation to resign. Quote, being a very honest man, he will himself proclaim that he was scandalously deceived, and those who knew him were aware that he felt very bitter about the plot of which he had been the victim. Unquote. And the Abbe Brugret adds that he stopped at all communications with his former confessor and even refused to see him again when dying. After reading all this, written and published in the Civilta Cattolica, the house organs of the Jesuit, it would be superfluous to dwell even deeper on the order's culpability, and we can only agree with what Josef Reinach wrote about them. What did Josef Reinach wrote, and who is Josef Reinach? Well, we can have a picture of him here. Joseph Reinach, who lived between 1856 and 1921, he wrote, quote, You see, it is the Jesuits who contrived this dark affair, speaking of the Dreyfus affair, and for them Dreyfus is only a pretext, a precursor, a starter. What they want, and they admit it, is to strangle the laity and a redirected French Revolution. Abolish foreign guards, the dogmas of 1789. Unquote. This is clear enough. But as some still insist, against all evidence that there was a possible disagreement between the Pope and his secret army, between the intentions of one and the actions of the other, it is easy to show the emptiness of such a supposition. The case of Bailly is very enlightening in that respect. What can we read in La Croix on the 29th of May in 1956? I thought that I have a paper, uh, I have a picture here of this um, uh, magazine La Croix, didn't I? Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Etude, La Canouette, Dreyfus. Well, must be somewhere else. I don't see this right here, so let's just continue, change the picture and continue what we are reading here. What can we read in La Croix on the 29th of May 1956? Nothing less than this, quote, as we have announced his <laughs> quote-unquote eminence, Cardinal Feltin, ordered a research into Father Bailly's writings. He was the founder of our publication and the Maison de la Bonne Presse, House of the Good Press, that is in English. Here is the text of that ordinance dated the 15th of May, 1956. Quote, we, Maurice Feltin, by the grace of God and of the Apostolic Holy See, Cardinal Priest of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, whose title is Holy Mary of Peace, Archbishop of Paris, in view of the plan submitted by the Congregation of the Assumptions Augustinians and approved by us to introduce in Rome 
the cause of God's servant Vincent de Paul Bailly, founder of La Croix and Bonne Presse, in view of the dispositions and instructions of the Holy See regarding the act of beatification and research into the writings of God's servants, quote, we have ordered and order the following. Anyone, anyone who knew this servant of God or who can tell us something special about his life must let us know about it. Anyone who possesses writings of this servant of God must let us have them before the 30th of September 1956. Be it printed books, be it handwritten notes, letters, memoranda, even instructions or advices not written by him, but which he dictated. Unquote. For all these communications we designate Canon Dubois, secretary of our archbishopric and promoter of faith, for this cause. Unquote. Here is a servant of God between quotation marks well on the way to receive the just reward for his loyal services in the form of a halo. So we are speaking about the beatification of a Roman Catholic because he succeeded in the Dreyfus affair and he succeeded in putting up the fire of anti-Semitism in France at that time, right? And we dare say that as far as his writings are concerned and which were so carefully searched for, the promoter of faith will have too much to choose from. As for the printed material, this collection of La Croix, especially between 1895 and 1899, will supply the most edifying kind. Quote, their attitude of the Catholic newspapers, and especially the one of La Croix, constitute at the moment for all enlightened and upright minds what Monsieur Paul Violet, Catholic member of the Institute, calls an indescribable scandal. And this scandal upholds, in the Dreyfus affair, the most shocking mistakes, the lying and crime against truth, uprightness and justice. Quote, the court of Rome, he adds, knows it, as all the courts of Europe do too. But they suppress it. Indeed, the court of Rome knew better than anyone else. As we have seen in 1956, she had not forgotten the pious exploits of his servant of God, as she was preparing his beatification. No doubt the promoter of faith credited our future quote-unquote saint with those famous lists of subscriptions in favor of the widow of the forger Henri, about which the Abbé Brugret says, quote, Today, when we consider those calls for the Inquisition to be brought back, for the persecution of the Jews, for the murder of Dreyfus defenders, it is like listening to the delirious imaginations of wild and grotesque fanatics. Nevertheless, these are presented to us by La Croix as a great, as comforting and as cheering spectacle." Unquote. Now let me make another point in case you didn't get it. This Henri, who killed himself by slitting his throat, do you really believe that someone can kill himself by slitting his throat? Whether from left to right or from right to left? Today we would say he was suicided. Huh? But here it is actually written as if he committed suicide by slitting his throat. The one who was of course used as a Ponzi. The one who did the scam and when he did that job he could have been taken out of the way. And that's what they did with him. All those pious wishes concerning the Jews, Father Bailly did not have the joy to see them realized in his lifetime by these wild fanatics under the swastika. He could only take delight in that great comforting and cheering spectacle from heaven. And though up there spectacles of that sort are quite common according to the learned and especially St. Thomas Aquinas, the angel of the school. Of course we know that nobody is looking 
down from heaven to the things happening here on earth. That is unbiblical, but I think the author just want to make, wants to make a little joke in this by seeing that Father Bailey did not see that realized in his lifetime, but after his death and makes a little joke about it. So what did St. Thomas Dakin or Thomas uh, 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 Dakin? Well, now I forgot his uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, his his English name. Yeah, the Doctor of the Church uh, and his Summa Theologica, which he wrote when he lived between 1225 and 1274. What did Thomas Aquinas, the angel, the Church Doctor, have to say? Quote. In order to help the saints enjoy their blessedness more and increase their thanksgivings to God, question which God, they are allowed to contemplate in all its awfulness the torture of the godless. The saints will rejoice in the torments of the godless. Unquote. As we can see, Father Bailly, founder of La Croix, had what it takes to make a saint, persecute the innocent, curse those who defend him, give them up to be murdered, uphold with all one's strength lying and iniquity, stir up discord and hatred. These are, to the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church, solid titles for glory, and we can understand her wish to bestow the halo on the author of these, pi of these pious deeds. However, this question is asked, is the servant of God a wonder worker also? Because we know that, to deserve such a promotion, one must have accomplished miracles well and truly checked. What were the miracles accomplished by the director, founder of La Croix? Was it the transmutation for his readers of black into white, means of lie into truth? And white into black means truth into lie? To have presented a lie as the truth and the truth as a lie? Naturally, but a greater miracle was the fact that he persuaded members of the general staff and then the public that, after having committed an initial mistake, and when his mistake was discovered, it was in their honor to deny the evidence, transforming in that way the mistake into abuse of power. Errare humanum est perseverare diabolicum. What does that mean? To err is human. To persevere in the error is diabolic. The servant of God was not taking much notice of that proverb. Instead of letting it inspire him, he hid it under his cassock. In fact, the mea culpa, means I am guilty, is for the simple faithful and not for the ecclesiastics, nor, as we have just seen, for the military chiefs who have Jesuit confessors. There is no I am guilty for the simple faithful and the ecclesiastics. Who are the simple faithful? Roman Catholics. Because they are simple in their faith, because they do not know what they are faithful in. They do not even check the word of God. And, of course, the ecclesiastics, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. Nor, as we have just seen, the military chiefs, who of course have Jesuit confessors. The result searched for was the exaltation of partisan passions and the division of the French people. This is stated by the eminent historian Pierre Gaxot. Quote, the Dreyfus affair was the decisive turning point. Judged by officers, it involved the military institution. The affair grew. The affair became a political conflict. It divided families. It even cut the country of France into two. It had the effects of a war of religion, a crusade. It created hatred against the officers' corps. 
It started anti-militarism. It started anti-Semitism, I add. When we think of Europe of that time, Germany over-equipped with arms and surrounded by her two allies, when we recollect the Vatican's responsibility in the start of the 1914 conflict, we cannot believe that the dim, uh, diminution of strength in our military potential was not premeditated. How could we not notice that, in fact, the Dreyfus affair started in 1894, the year of the Franco-Russian alliance? Then the spokesmen of the Vatican were very outspoken about the accord, with a schismatic power which, to their eyes, was a scandal. Even today, a prelate of His Holiness, Monsignor Cristiani, dares to write, quote, Through politics strangely blind and ill-considered, our country seemed to take pleasure in provoking warlike inclinations in her formidable neighbor, which is Germany. In fact, the Franco-Russian alliance seemed to threaten Germany with encirclement, unquote. For the respectable prelate, the Triple Alliance, which is consists concerning of uh, which consists of Germany, Italy, and Austria-Hungary, was not a threat to anyone, and France was wrong not to stay isolated before such a block. With three against one, the coup would have been easier, and our quote unquote Holy Father the Antichrist Pope would not have had to deplore in 1918 the defeat of his champions. Now, this very last sentence is something that we have to analyze a little bit deeper. And with that I want to stop the reading of today in the secret history of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. We are speaking about the alliances here. We have the Franco-Russian uh, alliance on the one hand. We have the Germany-Italy-Austria-Hungary alliance. And we have to understand that making these alliances, everything is controlled from the back by Jesuits. They play both sides. They are going to incite their enemies to make war against each other. And the laughing third party in all of this is the Roman Catholic Church. So when their alliances are set, France and Russia against the alliance of Germany, Italy and Austria-Hungary, and then later on putting in the, the English and the Americans, and then the First World War can start. All the enemies of the Roman Catholic Church are destroying each other. The Germans go against the Russians, the Protestants against the Orthodox. The Orthodox are, 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 are the Catholics in Croatia, but that's in the Second World War, so I'm not going to speak about that, just about the First World War. The Germans go against Russia, they go against France. France and Russia have a alliance, and you have the alliance of the of, of French and Russian with the aid of the English, and then later from 1917 on the Americans to come also into that uh, into that very first world war to crush the alliance of Germany, Italy, and Austria-Hungary. And by that, the only gainer in this world war is the Roman. Catholic Church. And with these thoughts I will leave you until next time, because for now I think the reading was long enough of the secret history of the Jesuits. But I hope that you understand what we read today with the Dreyfus affair, with the starting, with the, with the kindling of the fire of anti-Semitism in Europe, the foundations were laid for what later happened during the Third Reich in Germany before and during the Second World War when the quote-unquote Holocaust happened against the Jews 
that was only possible because the Jesuits were kindling the fire of anti-Semitism already in France and in Europe in the end of the 19th century, starting with the Dreyfus Affair to pay back France for expelling the Jesuits before. So I hope you found it a very interesting, even though not easy, chapter to read. And next time we will continue with another reading of The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. Until then, Juggler 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off. Wishes you a nice day, God bless you, and bye-bye. A special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.